Hello, everybody. Welcome back. Welcome back. Thank you all for being with us throughout the day. Those of you who have, who have been with us throughout the day, thank you to our new attendees who have joined us for this session, the solution session. It's a great session to join, by the way. And um, I will just start by letting people know that you can put questions in the Q&A and there, there we see there's already one question, which is the next subject that I'm going to go into. For those of you who have been participating in the workshop piece of today, which is you're out there, you're investigating, you're finding out, you know, about crisis response options in your own community. We are up to our last question, question number five. Um, and the way that you get to that question is you click on the bit.ly link that's in the, the main lobby chat. And I think Juan might post it in this chat as well. And question number five is, who determines whether a mental health call gets a mobile crisis team response or a police response? So that's assuming, for those of you who answered the other four questions, that's assuming your community does have a, a mobile crisis team and you make a call, somebody makes a call. Who says, well, this, this, this is appropriate for a mental health crisis team or no, this is appropriate for a police response or there, there could be a third option, which is there could be a co-response, which is there could be police and a mental health team. But who makes that determination? Is it the dispatcher? Is there a social worker in the dispatch unit with, with the police command? Or, you know, do police, you know, if a mental health call comes in, do police automatically have to connect to their local HHS or crisis services and say, hey, this is a mental health call. Give us some guidance on how to answer it. So find out, find out how that works in your local community. All important to transforming crisis response. With that, we're going to move in to some folks, some experts who are actually implementing solutions. I am going to start by having our speakers introduce themselves because they can give you their bios far better than I can. We're going to start with Candace Coleman. Candace. Who are you? What do we need to know? First of all, thank you, Carlene, um, for facilitating um, and doing this conference. It's been really amazing. Um, my name is Candace Coleman. I am the racial justice organizer at a center for independent living in Chicago called Access Living. Um, I've been an organizer for the past, well, maybe 13 years. I lost count. <laughs> Um, and I organize a group called Advance Your Leadership Power. We have a base of about 20 individuals with multiple um, disability identities, uh, racial identities, and from across uh, the city of Chicago, mostly um, home based on the south and the west side. But again, due to lack of housing, we have to shift around a little bit. Um, and so I'll turn it back over to you, Carmen. You're on mute. Thank you, Candace. Okay, now we're going to go to Samantha Sam Fletcher. Sam, who are you? What do we need to know? <laughs> thank you, Carly. Uh, and also, I want to echo thank you for this conference. It's incredibly important. Uh, so I'm Sam Fletcher. I'm going to give you a little bit of my personal and my professional as an introduction. I am a member of the Cherokee Nation. I live in and have always lived in native culture, which is quite different than American culture that becomes important and a lot of the things I talk about. Uh, one of those being the makeup of my family. Uh, my husband and I chose to build our family for adoption. I have a 22 year old black son who is autistic and also uh, has bipolar. And so we've had many interactions with that identity, with police and responders and crisis over his lifetime. I also have a 21-year-old son who is Cheyenne, Cheyenne and Arapaho, as well as Black, 
who um, has also been diagnosed with multiple learning disabilities. And I have a biracial daughter who's black and white who is 19. Uh, so my family context comes into this in, in one play. And then the other is my profession. I am a social worker and I'm the executive director of the National Association of Social Workers for New York State. And I, I'll talk more about that in the work we do as we get into this. Thank you so much, Sam. And now we're going to go to Haley. Haley Van, is it Aram or Eram, Haley? Haley Van Aram. Aha. Yeah. And thank you, Carlene. I'm Haley Van Aram. I am a trial attorney with the Special Litigation Section of the Civil Rights Division of the United States Department of Justice. Uh, I've been with the Department of Justice since 2015, and I work primarily on enforcing the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about this uh, a little bit later, but much of my work focuses on enforcing Olmstead and the, ensuring that people with disabilities have um, um, can live and work in their community. But I also am working on enforcing the Americans with Disabilities Act in the course of um, investigations regarding uh, local police departments. So I'll talk a little bit more about that later, but I'm really excited to be here and thank you so much um, for this great conference. Thank you. Thank you. And so we're going to start with Candace, um, who is, as she said, with Access Living, a disability rights group in Chicago that took up the fight to change crisis response statewide. And I was very, very excited when I found out about Access Living and Candace and the work that this disability rights organization had been doing in this intersection of crisis response with um, you know, criminal justice or law enforcement involvement. And I wanted to know why a disability rights group decided to take an active lead in this type of work. Candace. Well, um, Chicago is an interesting city um, in terms of it being a place where a lot of community organizing happens, but a lot of policing also happens. <laughs> um, that being said, uh, my group, Advanced Your Leadership Power, actually started on this journey because we were working on uh, advocacy campaigns centered around the school prison pipeline and how do we prevent students with disabilities from entering into it um, at such a rapid rate? And what can we do to um, de-institutionalize people from the juvenile detention center? Especially for um, policies and procedures that were put in place um, in school um, that forced uh, what was deemed uh, not natural behavior into this system. And so a lot of people with disabilities were there. Um, once we were on that campaign, um, we started uh, collecting uh, stats and stories of people with disabilities who were impacted um, by the system but kept having repeat encounters with police officers. Um, and if you know anything um, about some of the Chicago social justice work, um, we had a few uh, victims who were really close to home for our group. Um, the first victim that really uh, raised light to this issue um, was a young man named Laquan McDonald who was shot 16 times. Um, and advocacy around his murder um, really shed light on, for us, like why are people constantly coming into interactions with police? What, what can we do? Um, to save the lives of those who have this interaction. Um, as we were discovering the Paul McDonald's story, um, we were taking anecdotal notes as um, stories were coming across the country of people who people with disabilities who had interactions with police. And what we noticed is that they always talked about the death, they always talked about the process, but they didn't talk about their disability identity, their story, or what services or supports, or any of them as people. Um, and then they always talked about the crime as something that they committed. And so Advanced Your Leadership Power group members decided that they were tired of counting uh, stats of very preventable deaths. And so we started to look at the criminal justice system as a whole to figure out how can we intercept uh, this contact that was happening with police. Um, as we were doing this research, um, 
one of our members' cousins was actually killed um, in 2012. Um, he was a 15-year-old young man who was autistic, um, and his family did everything that they could to make sure that he had the services and reports that he needed in order to be successful. But unfortunately, the professionals were saying that when he was in a crisis or had a meltdown, that they should call 911. Um, and so as they had to do that um, at least 10 times, the presence of police kept escalating from a few people to a lot of people. And so even in their family, the conversation that they had was that this is a very scary situation. We don't want to do this no more. And when they actually had that conversation was the time that he was actually murdered. And so um, AYLP decided that we were not going to uh, take statistics anymore, that we really wanted to do something about it to intercept the system. Um, if, the other thing about Chicago is that our mental health clinics were closed. And so people were getting funneled um, into the Cook County jail system at rapid rates as well. And so as the fun mental health movement was going on, we decided we wanted to shift the conversation to get more to the core of where the services and supports needs to be in place so that people wouldn't have to rely on um, the police in order to get help. We believe that having a mental or behavioral health crisis is not a crime, and so what, what should we do about that? And so the SESA Act was actually born um, from that. Uh, we looked at the system, we studied the 911 calls, we learned that uh, a large percentage of the calls were calls that didn't need uh, police uh, as escorts for folks who were in crisis. Um, and so we decided that we wanted to have a service that was for us that included our voice in it, um, but allow uh, mental and behavioral health professionals to provide that support instead of police officers. We also noticed that in the statistics, everyone was funneled under the mental health category under their files and they didn't have a, a reflective um, uh, data of other people who use the service, um, such as those who are, who are autistic, those who have other behavioral health um, disabilities, and as well as other types of disabilities who would need help uh, in crisis. And so we, through the SESA Act, it does three things for the state of Illinois. Um, one, it mandates that mobile crisis units are available to municipalities that can handle the service. Two, it, we noticed that the services and supports was fragmented in areas of lack of resources, in particular those in, in the black and brown communities. It was a guessing game as to where to take people. It's still a guessing game now, even today. Um, and so we mandate that the state of Illinois creates committees that include emergency response people with lived experience and the community organizations that provide the service to come up with a plan when people have mental or behavioral health crisis. So it's not a guessing game if um, 911 is called or if any emergency response system is called. Um, the other thing that we really, really took time to flesh out is the ideas around um, not institutionalizing people any, even more um, and so one of the other unique things about the legislation is that we do not mandate um, involuntary commitment. And I think a lot of people don't talk about that as well. Um, and so those are the three things. It mandates the mobile crisis units. It creates those committees across the state to come up with an actual plan. This is the first time that emergency responders, people with lived experience, had to communicate with each other. Um, and so, um, that's definitely new. And then the last thing is, is to make sure that the data is reflective of, of the disability community and who use these services to support. It is not, I wanna give a disclaimer. We know that it is not the end all be all. It's just a piece of the puzzle and other things need to be added, shifted or changed in order to really get to the heart of the type of service that we want. No, thank you, Candace. And so Candace was referencing um, a state law that was passed uh, in Illinois very recently, I think a year ago, called, is short term is called SESA. I think it is um, Crisis Emergency Services and Supports Act. Community, and community we, Emergency Services and Supports Act. 
Thank you. Thank you. And we will put a, I can put a link to that law in the, the chat. Um, I saw Katie was asking about the legislation in Illinois. We definitely want to talk more about that because it is not a small thing to get um, a comprehensive um, new crisis response law passed um, at the state level. So we want to we're definitely going to go back to that. And um, I'm going to go to Sam now. And Sam's going to talk to us. She gave us a little bit of her background, Native American herself, and having children who are um, Indigenous at, as well as Black, and um, also being a leader in the field of social work. And that is really important because, um, you know, one of the things that we talk about when we talk about transforming crisis response is the role of social workers. And um, Sam, we had a question come up earlier from somebody who was um, um, who was interested in sort of, um, I guess, how we get people, social workers and others, whether you're you know licensed or some other form of mental health worker, um, into this field. And I want to talk a little bit more about that, and and just to acknowledge that. Um, we are not saying across the board that social workers are the answer and there is a lot of um, variation within the field of social work. Certainly not every social worker is called to be a crisis response um, um, worker. So, Sam. Thank you so much. So I love that you framed it like that. Um, and you're absolutely right. And, and the way I talk about this in social work, just like not every doctor is a brain surgeon, not every social worker is a crisis worker, but we certainly have a lot of crisis social workers. And there's some uh, people that are just really lean toward that. I always say, I'm not, I'm not a clinical social worker. I'm what we call a macro social worker. But if I were a clinical social worker, the only place I'd work is in crisis, uh, just because I like that type of work. So social workers are certainly not the answer. We're just a piece of the puzzle. And if you have a crisis response team, it's usually going to have a social worker on it. And the reason we're on those teams is because of our background and our education. So we social workers differ from other mental health professions by a couple different things. One is that we have a generalist education. What does that mean? <laughs> that means that when we're educated, we are learning about the macro. We call it a lot of times the person in the environment. So what's going on in the environment that is causing people to have certain issues? Uh, like we are always looking at structural and systemic racism, sexism, uh, ableism, all of those things, right? And then we also look at the individual. So all social workers are usually trained across all of those fields. So we have this very broad education. And the other thing that makes us different is that we have a social justice calling. Uh, it is actually in our code of ethics that social workers are to work toward social change with and on behalf of oppressed communities. So any social worker that is, and I always tell social workers uh, that I work with in New York State that like, I don't care if you're a therapist and you're doing therapy, it's still part of our code of ethics that at the same time you're making steps and trying to change the issues that are causing people to be in your office. So always doing that advocacy piece as well as sometimes direct practice or policy work or whatever we choose to do. Uh, so I do want to talk a little bit about the education. We have one accrediting body in social work. It's called the Council on Social Work Education, or CSWE, and they set our educational policy and accreditation standards, and those standards change or are updated about every seven years. They were just updated in 2022, and I'm just going to read a little bit of, about an addition that they, they just put in. Social work programs integrate anti-racism, diversity, equity, and inclusion approaches across the curriculum. This has always been part of our call, but they're saying essentially every course has to integrate this into the work. In addition to that, programs provide the context through which students learn about their positionality. So what are your identities and how does that impact other people? Power, 
privilege and difference and develop a commitment to dismantling systems of oppression, such as racism that affect diverse populations. So this is specifically put in now that all schools have to do that. Now schools have been addressing this for years, but can I say every class does? No, they weren't doing that. And it wasn't as pointed as it is now. The other thing is you have different tracks. We have uh, it, for a master level social worker, which those are typically your licensed clinical social workers or people that you would probably see on a crisis team, although you could see a bachelor level too. It could be either one. Uh, they may or may not have had a crisis class. They may or may not have had a class on disabilities. It depends. It depends on the program they went to, what the different tracks were. But there are things that you can kind of cross, like, okay, they did get this training. It just may not have looked like a crisis mobile team. We do have crisis mobile teams where, where students can intern. So that does happen. But they also intern in emergency departments. That is fantastic crisis training. You go to a trauma one emergency department and you will know how to deal with crisis. They also work in classrooms that are... Uh, classrooms with uh, children or students with disabilities. And they also work or do their field placement um, in maybe in different psychiatric centers, depending on what that looks like and where it is. So these are all ways that social workers could have that training. Um, but I think something that we have to address is how do we get more social workers in here and who want to do this work, right? Like, so we have that kind of broad educational background. I think we have to have more classes that are mandatory on crisis, on disability, and you cannot have those classes without talking about intersectionality, race, gender. I mean, when we're talking especially about like police killings, race is the number one factor there. What do people assume when they come on the scene? What do they assume about a white person in crisis? And what do they assume about a BIPOC person in crisis? And that is scary. That's, I know for me as a parent, it's incredibly scary <laughs> to have that, that thought of what are they assuming about my son uh, when, they, when they show up. The other thing is pay. Social workers are historically underpaid. Uh, one of the reasons for that is we're a female dominated field. I say between 70 and 80% of social workers identify as female and we all know about the gender pay gap, right? <laughs> like we don't get paid as much. And that's something that we're definitely addressing through the National Association of Social Workers. And in particular in New York state, we're addressing this. Uh, but, you know, when you think about crisis, and it, I know you all have been talking about this all day and like, who do you call? Wouldn't it be smarter to put some of those funds into your crisis team? Not only the social worker, but the other responders that are in there, those funds don't have to go to the police department, the crisis funds, they can go to your teams. I did a little research before this and in 2018 with CAHOOTS, I'm sure CAHOOTS has come up probably several times today. Uh, the model in Oregon that does very well. In 2018, out of 24,000 calls, 24,000, the police were only needed 150 times. That is an incredibly low percentage of times where the police were even needed on the scene. So that it just makes sense that that funding would go into the crisis team rather than the police department. Did I answer your question thoroughly there, Carly? <laughs> Oh, I think you're on mute. You did answer it, and I'm just putting in the chat some information. Cahoots has come up, but I'm going to put it directly into the chat for people about the Cahoots program. Thank you, Sam. And Haley, a thing that came up earlier today was um, a family whose um, son was having a crisis um, police were called, and uh, in this particular case, um, they did not wait for crisis services to arrive before they engaged, and the young man ended up being shot multiple times and killed, and the, the lawsuit in this case um, involved the ADA, the, the, the civil lawsuit, so 
why are we talking about the ADA as a civil remedy in these cases when someone is killed by law enforcement? Yeah, um, great question, Carleen. And it, it's it's a little bit, um, it can get a little complicated. So I did, I do have a quick PowerPoint to share because I wanted to talk about some of the things that we're doing at the Department of Justice to enforce the Americans with Disabilities Act in this space. Um, but also you'll see that as well in the uh, private um, attorneys, uh, like in that case, using the ADA to, um, to talk about these issues and to try to achieve justice under these issues. So let me just, I hope I can do this here, just one second. Okay, do you see my screen? Yes, I'm seeing, okay, great. Um, so, you know, I wanted to kind of give a brief overview of the Americans with Disabilities Act or the ADA. So just very, very generally at a high level, the ADA prohibits discrimination against people with disabilities. And it applies to, um, Title II of the Americans with Disabilities Act applies to all services, programs, and activities operated by state or local governments. So that can include the 911 call centers, police dispatch, and law enforcement interactions. So when we look at the ADA, it really is applying to the local governments, local law enforcement entities. And you know, discrimination under the Americans with Disabilities Act takes a number of different forms. It includes unequal treatment, and that can include classes of people with disabilities. So if, for example, um, a city is providing medical services to people with a uh, physical health disability, but law enforcement response to people experiencing a behavioral health crisis, that could be discrimination under the ADA. Um, also applies to denying people with disabilities equal opportunity, the failure to provide effective communication that can occur a lot of times in a law enforcement contact if you know law enforcement is um, not uh, not communicating effectively with somebody who is deaf or hard of hearing, or um, you know, not using adaptive aids, or not using proper de-escalation techniques like speaking slowly and calmly. Those could all potentially be sources of discrimination under the ADA. And it also, um, discrimination under the ADA is also segregation of people with disabilities. Um, and under the ADA, cities and counties and states are required to make reasonable modifications when necessary to avoid discrimination. So I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, our Olmstead enforcement. I know some folks throughout the course of this um, conference today have talked about, you know, sort of the role of hospitalization and institutionalization in this system. And it's really important that we think about that as well as the law enforcement encounters because they're often interrelated. Um, so DOJ enforces Olmstead and the integration mandate, and those things require that services that states and cities and counties provide be administered in the most integrated setting appropriate. So an example is in Delaware, and we did an investigation in Delaware, and in 2010, we concluded that people with mental illness were placed in Delaware State Hospital when they could be served in the community, and many of those hospitalizations could have been avoided. Um, Oops, I went too far. Let's see if I can go. Um, and so we entered into a settlement agreement and to really try to transform from an institutional to a community focused um, service system. And some of the um, parts of the agreement include things like a crisis system, walk in centers, mobile crisis teams, um, crisis apartments. Um, state-wide crisis hotline, crisis stabilization. Those are all things that folks have, especially mobile crisis teams that folks have talked about throughout today and that are relevant in this context as well. Um, because if mobile crisis teams are available, in addition to reducing law enforcement contact, it can also reduce unnecessary institutionalization. There's other services under the, that agreement like supported housing, um, intensive supports like assertive community treatment teams and family and peer support. And so this agreement ended in 2016 um, and court oversight ended at that point. You know, the agreement reduced reliance on state hospitals by 47%. 
Um, the mobile crisis teams were diverting 80 to 90% of people from the hospital and criminal justice involvement. And so that was um, you know, a, a good example of how something under Olmstead and applying the Americans with Disabilities Act under Olmstead can result in those positive outcomes. So now turning to specifically law enforcement contact and thinking about the ADA and policing. Um, so the D Department of Justice has conducted investigations of police departments, and we've examined whether cities have violated both the Fourth Amendment and the Americans with Disabilities Act. So DOJ has made findings regarding excessive force used against people with um, disabilities and people in crisis under both of these uh, provisions. Um, under the Fourth Amendment, you know, um, we're really looking at un unreasonable use of force. And so that's, um, you know, there is case law that officers, if they know that someone has a uh, mental illness, need to escalate their, their level of force downward. And we have found violations of excessive force involving people with disabilities specifically and people with crisis in a number of cities including New Orleans, Seattle, Portland, Cleveland, Ferguson, Baltimore, and Chicago. But I wanted to talk a little bit more about Baltimore because we also found violations of the Americans with Disabilities Act in Baltimore. And um, as part of that, um, a part of the settlement agreement that resulted, you know, there was requirements for crisis intervention training um, with Baltimore Police Department, also dispatcher training, then really looking at the city performing a gaps analysis of behavioral health service system and recommending um, solutions. And, um, you know, so the city conducted a gaps analysis and really went into a lot of community-based mental health services that were gaps and developed a plan to develop them um, to, to lead to less use of law enforcement when people are experiencing a behavioral health crisis. Um, so part of that sample findings were, you know, like really expanding mobile crisis response teams, expanding respite, um, and expanding services like supported housing and employment. Wanted to just briefly flag um, that we have open investigations regarding the Americans with Disabilities Act into um, the following police departments and cities, Minneapolis, Louisville, and Phoenix. These are active ongoing investigations and they, you know, involve a number of other issues other than the ADA. Um, the ADA is one component of these investigations. You know, but for, for these investigations, we're really looking at um, not only law enforcement interactions with people with disabilities, but also looking at the decisions to deploy policing services to behavioral health crisis in those cities. And, in, and that includes whether there could be utilization of a behavioral health focused response. So those investigations are ongoing and we haven't, we haven't made any determinations there, but that's really what we're looking at there. And it's really in line with what everyone has been talking about today in terms of the, you know, trying to ensure that behavioral health professionals are responding where possible. Uh, I think that, you know, the devil is really in the details it, with regard to these questions. And a lot of this um, where cities have programs to respond to people with, in crisis, their success can really vary based on some very specific criteria. Um, you know, when, when certain calls are diverted, um, when certain calls are sent to the mental health system as opposed to sent to the police. And so, um, you know, all of this takes a really detailed look into particular systems, um, but you know, I did want to let you know that we have these three investigations open uh, and, we'll, you know, if we make determinations that there's a violation of the Americans with Disabilities Act, that will be issued in a public report. I've also included a list of, of other guidance. There's some really helpful resources on these websites um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of criminal justice and the Americans with Disabilities Act and really ensuring that behavioral health services can be um, can be deployed in some of these circumstances and then can work with like the dispatching systems to ensure that happens. And Carlene, I think you had said that some of these resources could be shared with the group. So I'm hoping. Yeah, definitely. People have already asked for the PowerPoint presentation. So we can make that available if that's all right. Yes, of course, of course. Now, the last slide, I'm almost done. I just wanted to also say 
that we have a complaint portal um, that we definitely welcome um, complaints with the, with the Civil Rights Division um, about you know, allegations regarding violations of the ADA or other civil rights statutes. And also I wanted to provide my information because you can also reach out to, to me directly about issues that are happening in your community. And I'm happy to um, you know, get it to the right person at DOJ. Thank you so much, Haley. So that so um, that answers one of the questions in the chat. Somebody was asking about whether or not they can file a complaint or have DOJ investigate their city or county. And so Haley just said that you can file a complaint or, or you can contact her um, directly. So I think that's useful information because I think a lot of people don't actually know that we can ask the Department of Justice um, Civil Rights Division to do an investigation. Um, and so you can, we can do that as individuals and we can do it as, as organizations as well. Thank you. Candace, I wanna turn back to you. Um, and Candace, I am an activist. I am on the ground. I work on these issues in my local community and I know how hard it is to push for the smallest bit of change when you are talking about law enforcement, because that is a deeply, deeply embedded um, system in American culture. I do not understand how a group of grassroots activists, especially disabled activists, were able to get an entire state law passed in Illinois. What happened, Candace? What did you do? Give the, give the rest of us some pointers. <clears throat> I gotta take a deep breath there <laughs> because I just want to say, first of all, it, it took nine plus years. It took a series of listening sessions um, of the people who were directly impacted. We intentionally went on the south and the west side to hear what people wanted, what they needed, and what, what the issues were. It takes a lot of relationship building. So as an activist and a community organizer, the art of one-on-ones, people's intentions, their goals, what type of work they want to do, um, and the gathering of like minds. Um, it took a lot of roundtable discussions. <laughs> we have pages and pages and pages of butcher notes. Um, this is interesting enough, the one way that I get to be an artist. I'm not creative in like the essential artist way, but to manifest something like this based off the pages that we've collected over the years and the notes um, speaks to how many people we've met with. Uh, it took a lot of educating, um, being in rooms that we didn't want to be in. Uh, so that meant sometimes talking to law enforcement, um, talking to the stakeholders um, in this process. The political climate changed at least four times over when we started this process. Um, I think a lot of people forget that uh, when we started uh, drafting the CESA legislation, we were dealing with a state that didn't have a budget for years. And so because we didn't have a budget for years, even though we were advocating for something like this, there was just no money for the state period. And so we had to do multiple years of talking to legislators uh, about this topic. We reintroduced this legislation three times. Um, the last time was the charm one. We had very active chief sponsors um, in Senator Peters and Representative Kelly Cassidy. Um, when I say they were active, they came and met with us um, multiple times. Uh, they took their activism um, to the legislative floors to talk to them about that. Mind you, we're pushing up against um, this conversation around what co-responder looks like and why that's a better choice. Um, and we're constantly saying, no, the better choice is a non-police response model. Um, and so we're still uh, advocating um, in that way. And the last, uh, not last thing, but the other thing is that negotiation, is the art of negotiation, like really understanding what you value, what you wanna put forward and what you're willing to kind of give away. And so we, we had a list of things that we knew we wanted um, and then we knew we didn't want to give away. And so negotiating um, was uh, the, a part of the process. I will not, I will be remiss if I don't say that this took multiple um, trained individuals to make this happen. So it just wasn't um, the leaders with lived experience in our group 
Um, we had to establish a coalition of uh, various institutions who wanted to see this move forward, uh, uh, clinics, um, social workers, um, other community organizations with lived experience, uh, nurses who saw what it looked like in the ER room, um, uh, research institutions, universities, um, other legislators um, and different people in politics. And I might be forget, forgetting a few along the journey just because this has been such a long fight. Um, and then the last but not least, COVID really put this movement into action <laughs> um, in a way because it allowed us to be in more rooms and to speak to more people, especially across the state. Um, and unfortunately, a lot of people tell me that um, when George Floyd was killed, they actually understood and saw what we were actually talking about. Um, and so having a political climate that allows and uplift what people want has really helped push us forward. Um, and that's just a few of the elements. And that is just a general overview. It doesn't even get to the thick of <laughs> rewriting, uh, talking to various organizations, going back to the drawing board, literally stopping the process at one point. <laughs> and like, we, we won't be able to move forward with this. Um, and just AYLP always having in their mind that we will continue to move forward. We never stopped, even when people told us that we couldn't do it. Even some of our own people said we weren't gonna do it. Um, and so, to be honest, when we actually got it passed in legislation, he was like, oh my God, we won. What do we do now? <laughs> like, we're so used to fighting. Um, but now the hard work really begins. One thing is convincing people, but the other thing is getting the implementation uh, process started. Um, this infrastructure doesn't exist. And so it's being built right now as we speak. And so keeping the heart... Um, of what it's intended to and making sure that the industries and the entities that have to pull off this work continues to keep what the center of the goal of what SESA is intended for. And that is to make sure that services and supports for people with lived experience with people with lived experience at the table get to decide how we want to get that response put in place. Mind you, we're up against unions, legal policies, various philosophies between social workers, uh, emergency responders, firefighters, um, and again, an over police state, and I'll, I'll end it that. But again, we, we're getting more coalition partners who are willing to see this forth, not only on a city level, the state level, but now with you all on a, on a United States level. So um, it takes a conference like this to really put like-minded individuals together to put uh, this implementation forth. And again, advance your leadership power is AYLP and we're housed um, what's out of What's AYLP? Somebody said, what's AYLP? Advance your leadership power. Advance your leadership power. Okay, My, I like it. The other thing is that we started as a youth group. And so we all graduated into this because we wanted to see this move forward. And so we graduated into a racial justice group to see this through. And so even though as a youth group, we were still working on the school prison pipeline, my group member said, no, we're going all the way. And so that was nine plus years. And, and so we're here. Thank you so much, Candice. Um, I'm going to read just a little bit of what the law says before turning to, um, to Sam again. So this is, this is the new Illinois law, the new it's short term is called SESA. Um, it says that the General Assembly of Illinois recognizes that the Illinois Department of Human Services Division of Mental Health is preparing to provide mobile mental and behavioral health services to all Illinoisans as part of the federally mandated adoption of the 988 phone number. I'm skipping down a little bit and it says that... Um, the General Assembly also recognizes that many cities and some states have successfully established mobile emergency mental and behavioral health services as part of their emergency response system to support people who need such support and do not present a threat of physical violence to the responders. Um, and in, in light of that experience, the General Assembly finds that in order to promote and protect the health, safety, and welfare of the public, it is necessary 
and in the public interest to provide emergency response with or without medical transportation to individuals requiring mental health or behavioral health services in a manner that is substantially equivalent to the response already provided to individuals who require emergency physical health care. They are talking about parity, which means that if you can pick up the phone and call 911 and ask for an ambulance because somebody is going into cardiac arrest, you ought to be able to pick up the phone and ask for a mental health provider because somebody is having a mental health crisis, somebody is having a meltdown, you know, somebody is on the streets, they're unsheltered, and there are, you know, there are some tensions, and they need somebody who can come out and um, calm that situation. So we're talking about parity here. This is, this is great. Um, can I, can I yeah. clarify, um, yeah. and I missed this piece, one of the other things that we had to deal with a lot was how are we going to afford to pay for this as a state, um, and I didn't mention that. One of the things that the state didn't know is that they were already paying for this service in their Medicaid dollars, especially for young people under the age of 18. It recently just got expanded to adults. So we were already paying for it in that way. The other thing in the lot, I get a lot of questions about this is why is it paired with 988? Um, as we were going on the timeline of uh, creating SESA, 988 was also coming in down the pipe, if that makes sense. And so even though this legislation is a zero funded obligation, 988 technically has the funds to do the work that SESA was already uh, trying to get implemented. And so what we said was, okay, well, since that's not happening, because many people said, okay, we got 988, why do we need SESA? And we need SESA is because people are not going to be programmed to be like, I'm going to call 988 now. There's still going to be people who want to say, I'm calling 911. And so we don't want to miss that gap of, of supports and services for people who are already understand what 988 is for. So people are like, why did you just go with the other line? And it's like, people are not, when people are in crisis, they don't remember those numbers. They just remember what's been told to them since they were, I don't know, yay high. I mean, you know, a, a small child. And so we have to make sure that we, we don't forget just because we're creating that new system as well. And so that's why SESA connects those two lines. And so it could be dispatched to those services that are being offered. Because 988 has to build an infrastructure with 911 call centers themselves and the um, services that are getting contracted to do it. And so I just want to give that little tip in there. No, thank you. No, that's the genius of SESA is that it says it doesn't matter what number somebody calls. If it's mental health, you get a mental health response, period. That's it. Um, and Sam, I want to, I, I really have a two-parter for you. I want, I want to start with a question that's in the chat. And I know this person has been with us throughout the day. So I definitely want to get the, the question answered there. But I want to come back later, Sam, to push back from social workers because you know, we're definitely seeing, you know, some social workers in Illinois, some social workers where I live um, saying, oh, but this is dangerous work you're asking us. So we'll, we'll get back to that. Put a pin in that. Um, here's the question in the chat, Sam. How do we address the pay disparity for crisis response? Because communities who may be recruiting social workers or um, professionals um, who work with the IDD community, behavior support professionals, uh, mental health professionals, when people can be paid more to be a police officer and without accruing the cost of schooling or licensing that goes along with professional development, can we realistically address the growing um, community, the growing need for community crisis response without addressing this pay and income disparity? I think we have to address the pay and income disparity. And I'm actually going to talk a little bit about what Candace was talking about. So my other hat that I wear as researcher, uh, my main research uh, area is social activism. And uh, I work with lifelong social activists. So everything Candace was talking about, and I see TJ also in the, in the chat, who I think probably works with you, Candace. This is all about activism. And 
one of the things, I mean, the research says, but also common sense, it takes an incredibly long time to get to change. Candace said nine years. We worked on this for nine years with all these groups of people and the work's not over. We got the legislation, now it's gotta be implemented. And that is change. And it's the same with pay. So we have to recruit and retain. The retainment is that pay. So what we're doing at NASW New York State is we did a salary survey. First of all, we got to know our legislators really well, um, because which is what Candace did. That was part of the work that her and her group did, because they're the ones who can pass policies. And then we also support our legislators. So it's not just us going to them with ask, but we're also like, how can we support you? So they'll call on us to testify. They'll call on us as experts on different things. So we develop this relationship with them. We have at our chapter, it's called Capital Action Day. We have it every year. It's um, a day we bring social workers in to talk to legislators. At our last Capital Action Day in February, one of our state senators came in and said, we think social workers should be paid more money and we should do something about your debt. Wasn't on our agenda, but we're like, we agree. So how do we do it? You tell us, what do you need? And she said, I need a baseline. What is the problem right now? What's going on with salaries? So we created a survey and we surveyed New York social workers to see what was their starting pay. Have they had increases? Uh, what does it look like over time? We also did demographic data because as with everything else in society, our BIPOC social workers are not being paid as much as their white counterparts. Uh, so we did a very thorough report. It's getting ready to be submitted, uh, detailing all of this because this is the start of us asking for more higher wages and for the state to implement that. So we're starting with our nonprofits and we're starting with our state social workers to recruit them. You have to pay them and you have to give them a reason to stay. So we're also addressing things like poor working conditions, uh, like people having caseloads. We have some of our state workers, their caseloads in 2010 were around 40 to 45. That's a very good caseload. They can do that well. Before COVID, it was 90. During COVID, it got to 130. And we're back to 110. You can't work with you can't work with clients. That's too many clients. You cannot do good work. So these are all things we're addressing through advocacy and activism. And it takes years. So we have to address it. It's not an option. We can't just say they'll pay us more because of course they're not. Like the, you know, the police officers have very strong unions, or not well, they have unions, but then they also have lobbyists, you know, like so we have to fight that. It's not an option. And um I like your question too, Carlene, about like social workers who don't want to do this work. And you know what I tell them? Then don't do it. <laughs> like then go into a different area of social work. Like that analogy I used at the beginning, not every doctor is a brain surgeon. There is a group of people that they go into medical school and they're like, I want to be a brain surgeon. And that's what they trained for. It's the same thing with social work. If you think it's too dangerous and you don't want to do the work, don't go into crisis care. Don't work with this population, work with another population, because there's plenty of people who do want to work with the population, have the training. And the whole dangerous aspect of this, you know, I live with, you know, I've lived with my son who has, you know, autism and bipolar. My husband also has autism and it's really about de-escalation is what we're talking about. When someone's in crisis, it's about de-escalation. That is the goal. How do we de-escalate them? I haven't met the person who de-escalates when police show up. Like I've just never met that person. And it doesn't tend to be a police officer showing up. It tends to be 10 to 15 showing up. So you'll have 10 to 15 police officers a social worker, a peer support member, and the police officers are the ones who take the lead whenever in that situation that does not de-escalate someone in crisis. <laughs> like you need someone who understands what's actually happening in crisis. They know how to de-escalate. They know how to change the focus, how to change the subject, how to remove people who are triggering in that moment to whoever's in crisis. You need people who've been trained in this 
not people who are trained in protection <laughs> and to use, you know, if they use a weapon, it's to kill. That's, that's never going to solve this problem. Like you need people who understand this and that like, oh, we're coming in gentle. We're using a soft voice. We're coming in, we're making ourselves smaller. We're not threatening. And that's what social workers are trained. You know, paramedics can do this. Uh, peer, peer workers are fantastic in these situations. So I hope that answered that, that question. You know, Sam, I think one of the issues is that um, as communities begin to implement some form of civilian crisis response, you know, the it, communities are implementing different types of models. And I know where I live, you know, what they're doing is, so we did get extra money to hire additional um, social workers. And I think they're adding on some peer workers as well. Um, but they are, they're county workers, you know, they're part of the county government. So they're part of, they're protected by the county union. Um, and they're not, you know, an independent model. They're not a group uh, like Kahoot and maybe the Denver, you know, star program of folks who said, this is what we're coming together to do. We are coming together to go out in the community and do this type of work to be an alternative to law enforcement. And I think there's just a different mindset because our, you know, our local HHS department works very closely with our police department. In fact, you know, for many years, and they may still have this today, they had a memorandum of understanding uh, between our um, county crisis workers and our police department that said we want police involvement in just about every aspect of us being involved and in going out into the community. And so, you know, that model, I think, is geared up from the start to have social workers who tend to over rely on law enforcement involvement in a community response. You know what I would do in this situation? <laughs> Please, <laughs> you, need a, you need a program evaluation. Mm -hmm. You need an independent program evaluation. That's another hat that I've worn for a, for a different type of program. But you need a researcher in there interviewing the people who are impacted by this. So the people who are making those calls, the families, as well as you interview everyone, the social workers, the police, because you need the research evidence that like this causes more distress with this model, because you've got to hit that again, going back to like Candace's and, and TJ's, their activism, right? Like you need that research to back up if it's effective and also like what's happening with the people that they're getting called out onto are, you know, are people being arrested? Are they being harmed? Are they, you know, are they being pepper sprayed? Like where are they taking them once they go out there? Because I hear what you're saying, the difference between almost like a nonprofit who doesn't have the constraints of the county, the county laws or the, the state law versus someone who's beholden. And yeah, if you have, again, then you may have people filling those positions who don't necessarily want to do crisis work. And so, you know, they're, they're not saying because the social workers that I work with who do crisis work, they love it. Like they, it's, you know, every day is different. They love going out and meeting the families. Like they get to know the people in the community. You know, it's just a different type of model than someone who's kind of forced to be there because they've been a county employee. Yes. Uh, yeah. And I think that's key. And we can talk a little bit about that when people um, come back and tell us what they found out as they made calls to discover what resources they have in their county. But but yes, these distinctions are key. Thank you. And Haley, um, as an attorney um, who works on these issues from a civil rights capacity for the U.S. government, you know, I've read a few of the cases where um, people have claimed, you know, excessive force violation of the ADA um, because their disability wasn't considered um, when they encountered law enforcement. And um, some of the decisions have sort of leaned towards saying, well, you, you can't expect a police officer to know somebody's disability status, that we're being a little bit unreasonable um, and expecting police officers to take these sorts of things into account on the job. Um, what, what, is, what, is, what have you seen from the inside there at the Department of Justice? Yeah, I mean, it can, it can frequently be an uphill battle 
for people to succeed in those types of lawsuits. There's, there's no doubt. Um, I think that, you know, and, and the, the law varies based on where you live. Um, and there's, you know, different circuits and they all, they have different, potentially different standards and different cases that they follow. But generally speaking, you know, the test is whether force is reasonable. Um, and there's a number of considerations in that, such as how severe the crime at issue, the crime at issue was, um, you know, keeping in mind that frequently there, there's crimes that um, can be pretty low, you know, quality of life offenses that are can still be considered crimes that law enforcement officers have, you know, the ability to, to go out and enforce. But that's considered in, in analyzing whether force is reasonable, as well as whether there's a threat to the safety of officers or others and the level of resistance. Now, generally speaking, officers who encounter an unarmed um, and minimally threatening individual who is experiencing conspicuous signs of mental illness must de-escalate the situation and adjust their application of force downward. So it would be a, um, you know, uh, less force would be considered reasonable when somebody is, is exhibiting conspicuous signs of mental illness. Um, but that, again, it's sort of like the devil is in the details on that. What does that mean? When is it reasonable that an officer should have known? And so that's really going to be a factual question. I think this kind of points to why it's sometimes more helpful to really think about the legal analysis more upstream, you know, looking at the ADA and looking at, okay, rather than thinking on an individual case-by-case -case basis and whether an, one individual officer made the right decision or not, looking at whether the jurisdiction, um, the city is, the city, for example, is um, deploying, is in total deploying its, its response in an equitable manner to people with disabilities. And so um, I think that's why, you know, kind of looking more upstream is actually really helpful because it, it does, when you're looking at a case-by-case -case basis, legally, it can get really tricky for people. Um, so I don't know if that if that's helpful, Carlene, or answered the question. No, it is. And I want to just give you all a chance to offer a solution from your various capacities um, uh, working in this space as we as we wrap up this wonderful session and then uh, just move into our conclusion in the, the main uh, main lobby again. And if you have time, if you're available to stay in, if our speakers are available to go back to the main lobby and chat with um, our, our attendees, that would be great. So from your various perspectives, solutions. This is Candace. First of all, I want to say thank you to the members of Advanced Your Leadership Power. Some of them are actually here. Um, without them, their stories, their drive to push things forward. Because we, while we were doing this work, we also had to live through the trauma, literally. Um, and so without them and the questions keep, where do, so what do we do? Um, what is the answer? Who should I call instead? And it's like, we have to develop that. Um, and so for me, the, the center of the solution is the person with the lived experience. And I we would I wouldn't be here on this panel without my team mobile team behind me, which is the AYLP members. And uh, various people have come and gone over the years um, and shared their story. And so I just I think that they are essential to the solution. Um, and so now they get a chance to participate um, on the committees that are making these decisions. And then having again our team mobile team behind to push and leverage the activism behind what, again, needs to be in place to center um, how we really want this to go. Thank you, Candice. Sam, solution as a social worker. Um, I do, I agree with what Candice said, that the community should be at the center of the solutions and the ones coming up with them. And just as me as a person, as a social worker, as a family member, I like, I would do anything to keep armed people away from crisis situations, anything. Like, can we just start with preserving life? <laughs> like that, 
people come out of these situations alive. That would be my my first thing. We cannot have people showing up with deadly weapons to a crisis call. Thank you. Haley, as a DOJ practitioner. Yeah, I mean, I think what I would say is, you know, I think the law does offer um, some ability to find solutions, but I think it's very nature the law and bringing legal cases is also limited. So it's just been really refreshing to hear about the success of activism um, in changing, you know, in changing the laws um, in a way that's outside of bringing a, bringing a lawsuit or DOJ bringing an investigation. So I think it's sort of, it has to be all of us working in our own, in our own ways for the same goal that it all kind of comes together. Well, thank you so much. I mean, this is this is just wonderful. It was inspiring. And I know, you know, we've definitely gone gone over time, but we, we just had too, you know, too many wonderful speakers and um, ideas that needed to be shared today to cut anything short. So we are going to close this session. Our speakers, um, as time permits, will be in the lobby and they can continue to engage with attendees. And I will go ahead and start our um, closing session right away. So we will see everybody in our closing session or in the lobby. Thank you so much for attending. <laughs>